Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I would like to offer a very warm welcome to both our live audience and to those of you who we will be watching uh, the recording of this event. It's the fourth and final installment of the European Conservatives Path Forward series. Our March event was a panel discussion with policy experts on three of the EU's controversial legislative priorities, security and migration policies, the digital transition, and the so-called Green Deal. Following up on those um, exciting discussions, we had focused events on uh, two of those areas, the Green Deal and the digital transition. And today, in the uh, fourth installment, we are going to be discussing security and migration. We will look at the fallacies of the European Union's migration policies and why they generate debate and resistance on the part of several countries. Our speakers will discuss what constructive alternatives there are to the current solutions that have been offered and perhaps examine whether um, controlled immigration can be beneficial to host countries. We have an, a, a number of discussion points. Uh, I'll give each of the three speakers uh, a chance to give opening remarks, and then we'll dive in with some questions both from me, the moderator, and from the audience. So without further ado, I will um, introduce our all three of our speakers, and then um, we'll start with Ben Habib. Uh, so uh, to my left, we have uh, a familiar face for those of you who were at our first Path Forward event. This is Pierre-Marie Sevres. Um, he is the director of uh, the Institut pour la Justice, Institute for Justice, a French think tank dedicated to justice, security, and immigration. And he will discuss the link between immigration and crime in various EU countries with statistics. Uh, to his left is uh, the member of the European Parliament, uh, Charlie Weimers. Um, he's, uh, he's a member of the Sweden Democrats, and he's been a member of the European Parliament since 2019. He's currently the vice chair of the European Conservatives and Reformist Group. And uh, to Charlie's left, we have Ben Habib, a former member of the European Parliament. He was elected, uh, elected as a Brexit Party member of the European Parliament in 2019 and remained in the role until the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the EU. Uh, currently, he's a member of uh, the Reform UK Party and a successful businessman. So we'll start with Ben Habib. Um, I understand that you have uh, also a presentation, so you're welcome to come to the podium. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this esteemed event. Um, is that coming through? I normally don't do slides, but I, I was sort of sitting at my desk yesterday thinking, blimey, this lot will understand their onions, so I better put something together that's convincing. Um, and I try, I've tried to piece together something that I, you know, it's hard for me to make sense. How do you move from page to page? Um, do you just, just click, yeah, there we go. I tried to piece together what I think goes towards explaining uh, the complete collapse, the apparently complete collapse in political will to protect our borders. And that applies as much to the EU, obviously, as it does to the United Kingdom. And I think the root of all evils, if you like, in this conundrum um, is pooled sovereignty. You would have heard Ursula von der Leyen and many other um, leaders talk about pooled sovereignty. Pooled sovereignty in the context of the EU takes it to another level. But of course, all major Western democracies are practicing pooled sovereignty to a greater or lesser extent the EU being perhaps the most advanced in the way that it does it. But the idea, without wishing to bore those of you who know more about this than I do, behind pooled sovereignty is for member states in the EU and for other states across the, uh, across the globe to give up parts of their sovereignty to independent supranational institutions who apparently can run us better than we can ourselves at the kind of unitized democratic um, uh, foundation which creates nation states. So you give up part of your sovereignty for the greater good. 
That's the theory behind it. But of course, if you give up your sovereignty, if you give up the right to govern yourselves, if you cease to believe that the nation state is the appropriate unit of governance, it has a whole host of other implications. So for example, language becomes immediately less important. You aspire to speaking something that's more globally uh, in tune. And moreover, if you're one of the proponents of pool sovereignty, you wish to undermine language and use language to promote your ideology. So we have great examples in the United Kingdom where language has been repeatedly used as a mechanism to both promote the political agenda as well as to diminish debate. And I mean, I'll give you one example which has got nothing to do with illegal migration, but you take transgender, for example. When a man wishes or identifies, gender identifies as a woman and wishes to transgender, we don't call him a transgender man after he's been through that process. We call him a transgender woman. Of course, he's not a woman. He's still a man. But by using that terminology, we've already, if you like, if you're on that side of the debate, you've already won the debate. You've shut it down. He's transgendered. He's now a woman. Um, and you have it with the so-called diversity and inclusion regime. When I was brought up, believe it or not, I think we've actually regressed from when I was brought up, but when I was brought up, all people were thought to be equal. I was brought up to believe that it didn't matter what ethnicity you were from, what your religious you were from, you were all equal. But in order to promote diversity and inclusion and to shut down debate in it, white people apparently don't seem to matter that much anymore. It's black lives that matter. And by promoting black lives, what you've done is immediately diminish the importance of white lives. You cannot have it any other way. To defeat racism, actually they've inculcated racism. Moving on from language, quite closely associated with it is culture. Again, if you want pool sovereignty, you wish to diminish the importance of individual member states' culture. It's more important to be globalist, less important to be British. So we have great movements in the United Kingdom against our history, our culture and identity. No longer are we allowed to be proud of our British imperial history. The empire is something to be ashamed of. Winston Churchill, who defended the freedom of Europe and the United Kingdom, stood arguably alone in many respects for two years while Russia was allied to Germany and the US was nowhere to be seen, is now regarded by St. Paul's Cathedral and, other, and others on that side of the debate as a white supremacist. And embedded in that, again, coming back to language, you can see how they've undermined uh, you know, British belief in our culture and our history. And of course, with that goes identity. You cease to be British. Pool sovereignty becomes a much easier thing to promote. And underpinning all of that, or, or the consequence rather of all of that, is a lack of self-confidence, is a breakdown in self-confidence. You cease to be proud to be British. You're almost ashamed of it. You're ashamed of being French or German. You have to be European. Um, and this doesn't just relate to language, culture, history, identity, and self-confidence. It plays into the economy. So the ultimate in the political experiment of pool sovereignty is the euro. We know the kind of straight political, the straight jacket of uh, that's created for many European economies in the drive towards this supranational state, the European Union. But we see it in other forms, uh, manifested in other forms of the economy. For example, many of you may or may not be familiar with uh, environmental social governance. How many people in this room are, are familiar with ESG? Have you come across ESG? Yeah. So ESG is the corporate equivalent of the political agenda. Through private business, they're now promoting the environment, social and governance issues. So you had this, uh, and with it, what that means is basically businesses have to d disclose what they're doing for the environment, what they're doing for their social contribution within, their, within, their, uh, within the areas that they occupy. And it's not sufficient any longer to be the guardians of capital and the producers of profit. You've got greater obligations. And they relate to these ESG things. So if you take the S in ESG, which is a really good example, I think, when it comes to illegal migration, yesterday, Lush, which is a company that produces pretty third-rate soap, as far as I can see, um, came out promoting the crossing of the English Channel 
by refugees, saying that they are welcome in the United Kingdom. This is a private limited company whose purpose in life should be to make money for its shareholders, inciting people to break the law to cross the channel. And I bet somewhere in their human resources department, in their compliance department, there's some bright spark who thinks that they can tick another social box by apparently putting their protective blanket around, uh, around these people who are breaking, law, breaking the law to get into the United Kingdom. And I hope Lush's sales collapse after that uh, declaration. So you see it in the economy. But what easier way and what natural consequence of pooled sovereignty is there other than immigration? If you believe in pooled sovereignty, you don't believe in being British, you don't believe in being French, German, Dutch, Polish, whatever it is, you believe we're all citizens of the, of the world. So you don't really care where people come or go to. You might as well have open borders because that's your view of the globe. And that is the essence of the collapse, I think, of political will to protect our culture, protect our history, champion our values, and to protect our borders. Oh God, I can't get this right. Yeah, here we go. So those who, is, who promote pooled sovereignty can't at the same time believe in strong borders. They're almost mutually exclusive. And when it comes to the protection of the United Kingdom's border, we haven't done it through what you would call border control, to which I'm going to come back. We've done it through a deportation policy. Um, we have a completely Western open border in, in the United Kingdom. It, those of you who follow the Northern Ireland Protocol will know that there's a common travel area between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And for reasons which I can't get into now, but I can, you know, very close to my heart, we've handed Northern Ireland over to the European Union. And we've, and we've left the EU uh, in sole charge of whole hosts of laws uh, in Northern Ireland, making Northern Ireland an economic part of the Republic of Ireland. It's a step towards Irish unification in which our own politicians are complicit. But what comes with that is an absence of a border down the western side of the United Kingdom, down the western side of Great Britain. If anyone can get into the Republic of Ireland, they can drive across the border to Belfast, they can hop on a plane to Heathrow, and they won't have their passports checked at all. We have no western border in the UK. And then on the eastern side, as you all know, we have an unenforced border. Because if you get in a dinghy and you come across the channel, you will be met by something that's called border control, border force. It's a complete absence of force. They ought to delete force and write taxi because it's basically a border taxi. You will be met um, at the point of entry into British territorial waters. You'll be given a life jacket, given a blanket if it's cold, brought onto what's called this border force boat, brought back to British shores. We do not have the will to enforce that border. If you, if you, and on days we get 400 to 1,000 people coming across the channel in this way. If you did the same thing at Heathrow Airport, 400 people got off a jumbo jet and they charged the E-gates without passports. It would be the surest, quickest way to get a gun <laughs> pointed in your face as you're held down to the ground. But for some reason, we haven't got the political will to police our eastern border. So we look at everything. We look at border control through deportation. What happens to people once they get to the UK? And the theory behind it is if that you have a rigorous deportation program, you will deter people from wanting to come in the first place. So under Priti Patel, who was Home Secretary a few years ago, a couple of years ago, she introduced something called the Nationality and Borders Act, which we were told would resolve everything. It penalized people smugglers. It reduced the rights of those who entered the country illegally. It made deportation easier. Uh, that didn't work. Then we had the Rwanda plan, which you may or may not have heard of. And the theory behind Rwanda is if you entered the United Kingdom illegally um, and you happen to be a single man, you are going to be deported to Rwanda. And the cost we discovered yesterday of what, deporting one person, by the way, no one's gone to Rwanda yet, and I doubt anyone will ever go. 
But the cost of deporting one person to Rwanda, according to Home Office estimates, is £169,000. We had 46,000 people come into the UK last year. We can't afford to pay, pay £169,000 every time we deport someone to Rwanda. It's a, fail, it's a failed scheme which will not pass muster. And even if people begin to go to Rwanda, which I, I doubt very much, it will not act as the deterrent that the British government wants it to be. If you're coming from France into the UK and there's a small chance you might be de deported to Rwanda, who cares, right? It's a small chance. You're going to take your chances coming across. Uh, we, we're now going through what's called the Illegal Migration Bill. So this is Suella Braverman, who, by the way, I like a lot. In all, I like her enormously. She says all the right things. And she's championed this bill as a mechanism by which deportations will be able to be accelerated. Uh, but, it, but, but again, it won't. It won't work because embedded in the illegal migration bill, I think it's section 51 in its current iteration, it hasn't become law yet, is a requirement for the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, to take note of any European Court of Human Rights rulings. Um, I ought to just talk a bit about the ECHR. If I'm, am I going on too long? A few more. OK, so the ECHR is the Supreme Human Rights uh, Authority in the United Kingdom, as it is in Europe. And uh, embedded in the Illegal Migration Bill is the obligation to you know, take note of what the ECHR says. So the minute the ECHR does a ruling, it's going to override the entirety of the rest of the bill. So the Illegal Migration Bill won't work either. And then we've paid and are paying France over half a billion pounds in order to plead with President Macron not to allow these people to cross. Of course, that won't work because Macron wants these people out of his country. And the more he lets them come across to the UK, the more likely he is to get more money from us. It's, you know, it's a sort of moral, moral, morally corrupt mechanism by which to try and uh, sort the problem. So deterrence by deportation will not work. Um, deterrence by the way we treat people will not work either. The minute you land in the UK, you get this taxi service, you get free housing, free food, free medical care, free dental care, and cash in your pocket. That is no deterrent, ladies and gentlemen. That is an open invitation to cross the channel and come to the United Kingdom. Um, I've talked a little bit about, the, uh, uh, about why deportation won't work, but the asylum system too doesn't work. We've got 170,000 people applying for asylum. We can't cope with them. The, uh, the legal system can't cope with it. The thing about human rights law is that every case is an individual case. You can't do blanket class actions. Everyone has to be heard, and it can go all the way to the European Court of Human Rights. So trying to deport people is a nightmare. Going through the asylum process is a nightmare. And our solution, the government's solution, effectively, is to waive it through quickly. To get rid of the waiting list on the 170,000, just waive them through. And that, again, doesn't work as a deterrent. You're basically saying you get here, you play the asylum system, and you're through. Um, and the EU, of course, is, you know, has major problems with the Schengen zone. The minute you get into Greece, there's no one checking your passport all the way until you get to France. That's a big issue. There should be border checks all the way across the EU. The Schengen zone has a lot to answer for. But we do have all the international law that we need to prevent these crossings. It's just that our politicians won't use them. Article 9, and they all come, at least as far as the United Kingdom is concerned, and any states in Europe that have a sea border, they all come in these various articles I've listed here, which you can go through later. But Article 33 is perhaps the one to look at and makes it utterly clear. It says, this is international settled law. In a zone contiguous to its territorial sea, described as the contiguous zone, the coastal state may exercise the control necessary to prevent infringement of its immigration laws and regulation within its, territorial, within its territory or territorial sea. That's the bit you need to focus on. We have every right for border force to cease being a taxi service and to refuse these people entry at the point of entry. If Italy did that, if Greece did that, if we did it in the channel, illegal migration would stop dead instantly. It doesn't because our politicians don't want it to stop because fundamentally, they believe in pooled sovereignty, and that is the root of the problem. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our next speaker, um, Charlie Weimers, um, would you like to speak uh, seated or standing? It's standing. up to you.
Thank you uh, so much, Ellen. Uh, it's uh, great to be here uh, discussing a very, very important topic. Um, I was asked to elaborate on the Migration Pact and uh, the current ongoings in the EU institutions as migration is concerned. Now, in recent months, there have been major developments in relation to the EU's asylum and migration pact. Uh, some of you uh, may remember a few weeks ago with much fanfare, the member states reached a common position for negotiations, trilogues, that began um, quite recently. The main legal act, the regulation on asylum and migration management, reforms the Dublin Agreement that sets the rules determining which member state is responsible for uh, asylum applications. While the new asylum procedures regulation attempts to harmonize border procedures, the council, the member states, the council hopes that these reforms will prevent, deter, and ensure returns of illegal migrants. And um, surely a German MEP from uh, the left, Cornelia Ernst, went so far as to say that uh, the council deal was, and I quote, a de facto abolition of the right to asylum, end quote. Now the agreement reached in the council is an improvement compared with the original proposal from the commission and the adjusted version proposed by the European Parliament. However, even if fully implemented, without being watered down in any way in negotiations with the parliament, member states will be left with many concerns. At the last Justice and Home Affairs Council, many member states expressed disappointment at changes that would hinder the return of migrants to safe third countries, for example. The Danish minister from uh, a um, social democrat-led government, should be mentioned, he worried the pact would make it difficult for member states to develop and implement innovative models, such as their plan to relocate uh, refugees outside the territory of the European Union. They are also talking about Rwanda, feasible or not, it's innovative, I must say. Um, the council agreement um, as such is fragile. It really balances on a knife's edge. Member states who advocated natural responsibility found the 30,000 relocations per year agreed and 20,000 euro per migrant that a country do not want to receive too high. Border states wanting more solidarity found it way too low. These dividing lines touched other areas such as exempting minors and families from border procedures or permitting migrants to be sent to safe third countries they previously transited through. Speaking of the pact's solidarity mechanism, the Lithuanian minister said bluntly, it risks becoming mandatory, semi-automatic and unpredictable. Furthermore, what is the risk that the minimum number of re relocations are increased year on year? But again, we're talking about an agreement that has been reached by the member states. It has some legitimacy. Now, it will incorporate the wishes of the European Parliament, a woke, weak, and distracted institution that long has opposed our vision for secure borders. I'm sure the Parliament will fight tooth and nail to water down or outright delete measures to ensure stricter border control. And let us not forget, forget about another part of the migration pact, the crisis regulation, the crisis mechanism, which the European Parliament would like to see replace flexible solidarity with mandatory solidarity, i.e. relocations of migrants from frontline member states to Sweden, Germany, Netherlands, so on and so forth. Volumes decided by unelected bureaucrats from the European Commission's Commission, allocations decided by the, by the very same institution, according to these 
EP proposal. The member states, they don't want to touch this proposal with a 10-foot pole. The European Parliament, they say it's all or nothing. It's a package deal. I would say that if the EP pushes for this line, there will be no migration pact because the stakes are just too high for the member states. So they have an interesting choice here. Either let itself be steamrolled by the member states or stand its ground and watch the migration pact go down in flames, maybe not in flames, but yeah, with a whimper at least. Um, I mean, we are facing huge challenges and maybe I'm quite often <coughs> painting a quite bleak picture, but I want you to know that I'm not without hope. Three months ago, the European Par Parliament gave the green light to begin negotiations on Commissioner Yuwansel's migration pact. It may surprise you to learn that the EP never intended to hold a plenary wide vote. The Brussels establishment didn't want the people to know how all of their representatives would work. The problem is that in order to challenge the mandate for negotiations, we needed to reach the medium threshold, which is 10% of MEPs. Neither the ECR group, which I'm from, or the ID group, which also is skeptical towards mass migration, neither one on our own is large enough to uh, force such a vote on our own. But by coming together also with Fidesz from Hungary, we, will, we were able to achieve what we could not do alone. And that, as such, was a major victory. Why? Well, this is one of the most faithful legislative proposals of this mandate. And one year before the first plenary vote on this pact, if I go back to my own country, Sweden, only one in four had ever heard of the Migration Pact. Now, over two-thirds know about the pact, and I'm quite confident that they are not impressed by what Brussels have come up with. So how did Swedes learn about it? Well, we communicated actively before and after the vote, uh, which gained significant media attention. Our party made it clear to the government we have a supply and confidence agreement with the government, so we're part of the majority, the Sweden Democrats, my party, but we're not in government. But we made clear that forced solidarity as envisioned by the Commission and the European Parliament is a non-start of us. It would jeopardize uh, the continued existence of this set of right government. And we didn't stop there. We uh, gathered democratic forces in the European Parliament to defend the external border and support restric restrictive migration policies. We call this informal network um, the Migration Policy Group. This is not to be confused with political groups such as the ECR group, ID group, EPP, and so on and so forth. It's not associated with, beholden to, nor dominated by any single group. In fact, we've reached out to social democrats from countries like Denmark and Estonia that have more understanding for our point of view on border walls or external migrant camps than, uh, for instance, the German social democrats, which seem stuck in the past on migration. At our inaugural meeting, parties critical of mass migration to Europe exchange views on the pact and identify issues on which we were to uh, pursue joint action. So the group is a forum that brings together parties in government, parties in opposition, parties that support the government, and we exchange ideas, and we, uh, we have settled into a pragmatic compromise approach where we uh, um, either find inspiration if we're in our position for a bit harder line, and uh, we also get an understanding among opposition parties for why pragmatism is sometimes needed. Um, the second thing is that together we reach the threshold required in the European Parliament. It gives us the ability to object and file procedural motions, file joint amendments for the plenary and so on, and, and uh, try to, sometimes when it's needed, stop the process or halt it at least. Finally, 
And most importantly, I'm confident that this network will not just bring attention to uh, the issue of migration, um, but that it will pull the mainstream right closer to us. There will be a European consensus on tougher, restrictive migration policies. So, where are we in terms of uh, migra migratory pressure, pressure as a whole? Well, we're almost back in, at 2015 levels in terms of illegal entry. Question is, what happens if we signal a willingness to accommodate further legal and illegal migration? Will numbers double or increase five or tenfold? You might think that that sounds far-fetched, but ask yourself, how many migrants will come from Africa whose population UN projections show will increase to 2.4 billion by 2050 and nearly 4 billion by 2100? Massive population growth is unlikely to make Africa or the Middle East more stable regions. That's why it's so important that we don't signal to the rest of the world that anyone that comes to Europe will, will be taken care of. The sea change in attitude and the differences between the Parliament's open borders and forced redistribution vision and what was adopted by the Swedish government and Premier Meloni's government is clear. The question is whether the member states will be able to win the day. To restrict migration, the legal foundations of any rules introduced will have to be rock solid. They have to withstand targeted attacks from an army of human rights lawyers, arbitrated in courts packed with far left activist judges in Luxembourg and Strasbourg, with implementation and operalization overseen by woke commissioners. I might add that in Strasbourg, the human rights court there, they're called judges, but many of them are former lawyers, uh, human rights lawyers who are now working with the same cases they fought for uh, on the NGO side. That's important to know. Another perhaps even more pressing problem is that over 80 thousand migrants already have entered Italy the first four months this year. What is 30,000 agreed by the Council when we face hundreds of thousands? Nothing. These caps risk busting at the first moment of pressure. If the activists win in the courtrooms and the border states give up on or no longer want to do their part, the only thing that remains of the system put in place will then be financial penalties and the same mass movement north that we saw in 2015. That cannot re be repeated. And as a matter of fact, I think it won't. Because what will happen then is internal border controls. Sweden will introduce it, a hard border to Denmark, Denmark to Germany, Germany to Austria, Austria to Italy. So the external border will be the south of Austria. So Italy in that position cannot wave through migrants like they did to naive uh, member states such as Sweden in 2015. It would be, have to stop boats at sea in the Mediterranean and basically the Australian model would be implemented by default. If you enter Europe illegally, you will never make Europe your home. This is what we realized in Sweden, and this is why the ultimate responsibility in the end must reside with member states' governments that are accountable to their voters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, our final speaker um, will uh, address these issues from, uh, let's say, the impact of migration on crime. That's it. I think standing is the way, so I'll stand as well. Um, so security and migration. For many people, these two issues are different and there's no link between the two. Last time I came here, I talked about uh, illegal immigration because 
the EU by the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights and by the European Commission are mainly focusing on the legal immigration um, to implement their liberal agenda on migration. Uh, and also national security threats, that's what I talked about last time, because we, especially in France, we have seen uh, entire um, procedures fall because the EU had implemented new laws about whatever, phone, phone recording or, but, but things that uh, threaten the, the national security. And so these two issues, traditionally, when I did my law studies, I studied in, in Paris, in La Sorbonne University, my criminal law teacher used to, to say, well, you students are lucky, because I was studying criminal law, and you students are lucky because you're the only law students that won't need to speak English. And in France, we're not very fond of English. So uh, I was supposed to be one of the few, my presence here, uh, teachers, teachers heard that she was, he was wrong, but, um, but traditionally, that's it. Criminal law is a national matter. Um, but things are changing. Things are changing fast, and the EU and the European Court of Justice are trying to put their own agenda, and it is a liberal agenda. It could be a conservative one day, but it is not at all. It's a liberal agenda. But today, I don't want to talk about the actions of the European Union and the European Court of Justice, but I want to focus on one single thing that is to me the foundation of all the, the thoughts we can, give in, we can give into that subject. And this foundation is as simple as there is a link, a direct link between migration and crime and rising crime. So first, I'll talk about the theory. Um, so this is a French reference. There is a, a criminologist, so people that study crime, uh, there is a Canadian criminologist that's called Maurice Cusson. Maurice Cusson, very well known, very well respected and all, all across the political uh, framework. Um, and Maurice Cusson, he studied uh, the history of crime and he studied mainly the history of, the, of crime in the West, so in North America, because he's Canadian, but also and even more in Europe. And so he took an example that I, found, I find really, really interesting. He took the example of England. So in England, in the 15th century, the homicide rate was about 20 homicides per 100,000 people. And it slowly decreased. So in 1700, it was about three homicides per 100,000 people. And now it's around 1.5. This tendency is very, very similar to the French data. And we can say that it's probably the standard evolution of crime in the West and probably in all civilization. And there's another uh, French historian, it's called Claude Gauvard. She's also referenced. Um, and she explains that over time, as civilization takes hold in, inside a society, um, people have a tendency to rely more on the state to manage their personal uh, problems with, with each other. And so it's kind of a, a pacification of society. And of course, on the other hand, we, we can see pacification has the tendency to, to, to make individuals a bit weaker. That's also true. That's something that we saw many, Ibn Khaldun, maybe you know him, uh, an, Arab, an Arab medieval author that historian that was uh, and philosopher that explains this very well. But so the value of notions uh, uh, of values change as crime decreases and as people rely more and more on the, ju on the judicial system and on the state to, to manage their problems. And there is one specific value that I find really interesting. The value of respect and reputation. We can it's hard to say that scientifically, but we can all feel that in, in many, uh, for many criminals, respect and reputation are really, really important, maybe more than for us. And this, has, uh, uh, this can be explained criminal, criminologically um, from this criminology point of view. Reputation and respect were a shield for you to defend yourself in the medieval era. If you had a bad reputation, if, you, if people knew that they could disrespect you, you would be 
attacked and disrespected even more. And so you had to maintain a good reputation and, and, and to, make, to be respected. And so for me, this evolution is specific to every civilization, but it's always the same. It's, it's a standard evolution. So you can find it in Europe. You could probably find it in another civilization, maybe China. Probably all ci human civilizations would follow the same trend and the same path. But we're, we will all follow the same path, but we're not at the same stage, each civilization in the world. And so when you put, when you accept migrants from other civilizations, of course, you're going to mix peoples that don't share the same, that don't uh, um, attribute the same value to each concept. So for some civilization, respect can be very important because for their parents, it, it used to be extremely important. Uh, I don't know, in many states in Africa, there's no, there used to be no state, maybe in some cases there, there, there's no state still, but there used to be no state, so you could not rely on the judicial system to, to defend yourself. So for them, respect was, was very important, and they passed this along to their children, and, and maybe, so when you mix people up, and you, when you mix civilization and different cultural backgrounds, you, you lead, it leads to in, incompatibilities, and which lead uh, to violence then and especially when the judicial system is not prepared for this. So that's the theory, and I want to go, I won't be very long, but I want to go into the reality, so the statistics, because many countries in Europe um, public, publish their, their, their crime statistics, and we know uh, if foreigners or if even some citizenship commit more crimes than others. So I'll, I'll take, I, I talked to you about the homicide rate uh, in, the, in the medieval era. So I'll take homicide for, for start. So in France, Germany, and Italy, and Spain combined, you have around 2,000 homicides each year. The foreign population, population is 11%, but the foreign suspects represent 25%. So that's a lot. It varies from country to country. In Germany, it's up to 39% in 2022. So that's nearly half. And it's 18% in France, but we, we, I have to say in France, we have a tendency to give, uh, to, to give the French citizenship very easily, and it has been like this for, for a certain time. So, so it, it, it takes, um, so of course, the, 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 the figure is going to be lower. So this is, this is uh, all countries combined for all foreigners, but it varies also between the countries of origin. Of course, as I told you, violence is a cult, has a cultural uh, weight, a very important cultural weight. So for EU nationals, you go from, uh, you have around 0.5 per 100,000 inhabitants. That's a suspect rate. So you have 0.5 EU national that are suspects for homicides for 100,000 EU nationals. That's very low. It can be even lower than some of the countries I, I mentioned. Uh, for Russians and Ukrainians, it's around two. So it's a lot more, twice as more. For South Americans, it's three. So it's six times, you have six times, um, South Americans are six times more likely to be suspected of a homicide than an EU national. For Maghrebis, it's up to five. And for, and the champions are Afghanistan and Pakistan, which who stand at eight, eight for 100,000, uh, Afghanistanis and Pakistanis. So it, it's around 16 times more, they're more prone to be suspects. Uh, and maybe the migration and the increase of migration is also the reason, I can I, I talk from a French point of view, why homicides and homicide attempts have doubled over the last 10 years in France. Maybe that's one of the reasons, probably is. So that was for homicides, and I'll, I'll talk briefly on for other offenses, because there, there are some interesting things. So in France, in general, we have an overrepresentation of the foreign population as suspects for all offenses. It's true for all the crime categories that we have, uh, from homicide to rape to auto theft. They're always overrepresented. Uh, so this is for France. In Germany, we are very, very lucky uh, because there is the Bundeskriminalamt who revealed their um, they have very German and very well, well done statistics. They're, they're very precise. And we know the citizenship of 10 million crimes perpetrators for the last five years. So over the last five years, 
there were 11% um, foreigners in the German population. But they represent, I told you, 39% over the last year. Over the last five years, there, there were 42% of, of the murder suspects, of the homicide suspects. So that's almost half. If there was no migration in Germany, they were, you could cut the number of deaths by homicide by half, almost. For violent attacks, it's a bit less. It's 32%, but it's still three times more the proportion of 11% in the German population. For bug burglaries, it's 39%. And on and on. And if you go by citizenship, you also find interesting data. For all offenses, Afghanistan, Afghanis and Pakistanis are six times more likely to commit offenses uh, all combined than the average German. It's eight times for Africans and it's nine times for Maghrebis. So that's that's very that's that's really a lot. For murders, Maghrebis and Afghanis are 15 times more likely to commit murders than the average German. So imagine you have, you have two German in, in your jail, two, two German men, and you, you will have 30 Afghanistanis and 30 Maghrebis. That you could say there's a, it's more than just, than just the judicial system that doesn't work, or racism or whatever. Uh, for sexual offenses, it's also interesting because this tells you, I told you violence is something cultural. To see by each crime which citizenship commits more, more of them, you can also see that it's, it, it has something to do with culture. For sexual offenses, for example, Africans are 11 times more likely to, com to commit sexual offenses than the average German. Maghrebis, 11 as well, and Afghanis, 16 times more often. For pedophilia, Afghanis are once again, and Afghanistan and Pakistan really have a tendency, we find them in all sexual offenses, pedophilia, rape, whatever offense that has a sexual dimension, the Afghanis and Pakistanis are way ahead of all other citizenships. So, so it, it has to do something with culture. I don't know, I, don't, I could not explain why because I'm not an expert of Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it has, to do, it has something to do with culture. And so pedophilia, Afghanis and Pakistanis are six times more, um, uh, there are six times more suspects from that citizenship than, than German nationals. And so these differences between citizenship, uh, Maghrebis commit less, less sexual offenses than Pakistanis, but they commit more violent aggressions. It, it tells you something about culture and at least it confirms that violence has a cultural dimension. And I'll just end, um, because what I, I wanted to tell you, I wanted to make, to just talk about the statement that crime is related to, to um, migrations, uh, because I feel in France, when I arrived at the head of the Institute for Justice, it was hard to say that there was a link between migration and, and, uh, and crime. Uh, we slowly were able to do it, but I, I'm pretty sure it depends on each country. I'm sure in Germany, it's not as easy as it is in France. Maybe, maybe it's easier than, than it is in, I don't know, Belgium or I, I don't know. But so when talking to, the, to a European public as you, that you represent, uh, I want to make sure that this information that is really the, the, the basis of the, the whole um, reflection uh, has to be pretty strong. So this, this is why I gave you statistics and I gave you numbers. And of course, I'll just end with a small, a small word about the judicial system. These problems are cultural, probably, but it's also because our judicial systems cannot answer to this. Um, in Afghanistan, there was a poll conducted by the Pew Research Center uh, 10 years ago that said that 99% of the population wants Sharia law to be, um, to be enacted in Afghanistan. 85% uh, of the Afghanis want death by stoning for adultery. Uh, it's 89% in Pakistan. When you deal with, I mean, they can do whatever they want in their country. They, it's democracy, they can choose what they want to do. But, but here, it's not possible. And the judicial system, we just don't live in the same world. So when the judicial system, the judge is gonna say, okay, you'll be, you, you'll be on probation, you, you, I don't know, you, you, stole, uh, you stole whatever, and you'll, you'll get on probation, you'll, you'll do one week in jail, and then you'll get on probation. Of course, for them, it's an authorization to continue. It's not received the same way. But it, 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 was, it, it probably was the same in Europe. If you had a time machine and you could go to, to the 16th century, um, if, you, 
um, and, and bring someone from the 16th century, if he robbed someone, whatever, uh, he would probably think that he would have a harsh punishment. But today, to rob, it's not a harsh punishment. It's not because as a European people and as, as a European civilization, we really, uh, we, we have changed uh, our, our values and we, we fear. I mean, one day in jail, would, I would fear to go one day in jail, but probably then a few centuries ago, the average Frenchman would not have feared it as much. So of course, when you have such different <coughs> cultural uh, backgrounds, the judicial system can just cannot keep up. I really rem I, re I remember something um, pretty, it, w it was pretty funny. Um, a few years ago, I went into a court in France and I remember um, uh, two Algerian suspects and they had, I think they had robbed somebody. It wasn't, it was a pretty petty crime. And, um, and they had to meet a judge and they were, they were, they were almost in tears. They were so afraid because they, they had just arrived in France. They were so afraid of what would happen to them. And so the judge received them and she, and she, she even seemed, it was funny because she, she tried to have a, uh, uh, to, 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 to seem mean and to, to seem strong. But in the end, what she, what she was offering them was just, you're out, you're, you're free to go. And they could not believe their ears when they, when they heard that. They were free to go, but in Algeria, and they said it, they said it after. They said, in Algeria, we would have been beaten or, so we, so you see, it's justice has a, also as crime, has a very strong cultural root. And, um, and, and I think this is really something that people don't understand. And that is really the, the yeah, the root of all legislative framework we can try to implement and, and, um, so that's it's why and why I, I think it's a very important suspect and subject. Thank you very much. Well, I suspect we've saved the best panel for last in our series. Uh, we've got so much to dig into, and I, I think um, I think we'll only scratch the surface a bit. One observation I have. Um, in a previous life, I worked as a criminal prosecutor, and uh, there was always a lot of discussion, um, the word deterrence, right? This was always to be considered when we offered um, a sentencing recommendation to the judge. Uh, Your Honor, um, th this sentence is, is meant to act as a deterrent so that this person will never commit such a crime again. Um, Rarely are today's punishments um, any kind of deterrence for anyone. And then I was thinking about what each of our panelists has said about, uh, let's say, ports of entry and welcome taxis um, to the kinds of benefits people receive upon entry, illegal entry, and then what happens even uh, once they've been uh, welcomed into a country and commit crimes in their in their new uh, in their new country, uh, basically nothing. Uh, so all along this road, th there's literally no deterrent to uh, illegal behavior. And uh, we recently, at the European Conservative, we recently wrote a story about. Uh, a serial rapist in Italy. Uh, he raped three women, uh, no, excuse me, he raped five women over the course of a period of time uh, outside the train station in Torino. And it was revealed that, in fact, he had been known to the police for drug crimes. He had lied to the police and said that he was a minor. They believed him, so he wasn't held pending trial. Um, and only after a fifth rape of a woman was he um, discovered, detained. They did some kind of bone scan to see that, he, in fact, he was an adult man. Um, and one has to say, from every point, um, this is a failure from his entry to remaining, to being able to commit crimes, to lying about his age, 
to being released, to not getting caught after the first rape, and then only after the fifth rape are people up in arms about uh, what has happened. So, I mean, it seems to me that that story is a bit emblematic of, of what the three of you have said. Um, and uh, so I, I want, I know that there are probably questions from the audience, but I'll, um, I'll use my moderator's prerogative and just ask the question, um, if, as Ben has said, we're not really doing any border control, this is purely deportation and we're not really deporting people, um, what needs to happen? Um, I mean, uh, does it need to be this Australian model? Does it really, is there any other solution um, other than simply saying, everyone protect your own borders, build that wall, so to speak, um, and, and if you are a point of entry, like Italy, like Greece, like other places, well, you have to institute the Australian model. I mean, is that, is that the only solution? Well, I, I mean, I think, um, I think, yes, you know, fundamentally, you've got to start there. You've got to have the political will to have border control. I am half Pakistani, and I completely concur with what you said about uh, Pakistani attitudes to crime and so on. But one of the things that you would experience in Pakistan if you tried to cross the border from Pakistan to India is a shot to the head. Um, they understand border control. And similarly, an Indian trying to cross to Pakistan, he would be shot in the head. You might get one warning shot uh, across his bows and then you'd be shot. We do not have border control. And if you, and I, I, I don't want to labor the point, but if you don't believe in member, if you don't believe in nation states, that's when it all goes wrong. Because if you believe in France, if you believe in Germany, you believe in Sweden, believe in the United Kingdom, you wish to protect those entities. The, the second you cease to believe in those states, the need to protect them just evaporates. And we don't have the political will to do it. There is, of course, another dimension to it. And um, without, you know, I don't want to sound incredibly unsympathetic. Um, you know, the West has a great, to a great deal to answer for in its foreign policy and the way that we prosecuted it in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Iraq, Syria, the Arab Spring, Egypt, Libya. You know, there's been a disastrous 25 year period of Western interventions in these countries, destabilizing them with no vision for what to do, you know, for what comes next. And undoubtedly, that's part of the problem. And we'd be much better off investing billions, reinventing <coughs> these nations and investing in them and making it more palatable for their, you know, citizens to stay at home, not, not to come here. But, um, you know, we could start by ceasing bombing them. That would be a good start, yeah. Uh, well, I very much agree with Ben. We, we need to enforce the border. We, we, uh, we have the legal uh, tools to do it, just as Ben mentioned with the uh, UN Convention of the Law and the, uh, of the Sea. Uh, I mean, it's right there. You, you, as a sovereign country, can protect your borders, your you're entitled to do so. Uh, and also one very positive thing with the migration pact that uh, sort of provoked the left into these uh, tirades about um, abolishing the right to asylum was the fact that Italy negotiated uh, a part of, of the deal that concerned rapid uh, expulsions to Tunisia. And, um, that is uh, one big uh, step on the way to accomplish, uh, you know, secure borders. Another very important step will, will be when the EU realizes that if we are to have this Schengen zone without internal border controls, we, we better uh, support uh, our frontier member states with the means uh, necessary to secure their borders. I mean, because their borders are in effect, are all the borders of all of us. Um, so even the United Kingdom, to be honest, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Ben. Um, so, so we need to do that and we need, to, we, we, um, we need to realize that what's in front of us is existential. I mean, Europe is not growing. Uh, 
the EU has a population of around 500 million. We'll continue to have that maybe a little less with uh, thinking about the birth rates of Italy, Germany, and so on and so forth. But I mean, Africa will go from 1.4 billion to 4 billion within this century. I mean, we're talking, we're beyond, uh, you know, biblical exodus visions here. Um, so unless we do something, our grandparents won't be able to, um, to, to uh, you know, be part of a European civilization that way we take for granted. And by the way, I am a proud European. Uh, but I love Sweden as well. It's possible to do both. I, I'm thinking about this, uh, this distinction between um, the somewheres and the anywheres, right? And, and, and this often comes up when uh, there's a discussion of open borders uh, versus people who say uh, it's not wrong to embrace one's national identity. It's not wrong to love one's country. And then there's the sort of the globalist anywheres who are really happy to live anywhere, have no roots, think that in fact um, roots and home are concepts that are, I don't know, um, constructs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I, I'm thinking about this somewheres versus anywheres in the context of economic migration. And um, I come from the United States, um, a country built very much on um, people seeking a better life from somewhere else. Uh, and I think um, many countries in Europe have had some tradition of, of, of accepting migrants who are looking for a better life, um, who want to become the thing um, where they've moved. They want to become English. They really want to become Swedish. So, so there's a lot of discussion about, well, um, is there a distinction between um, economic migrants versus refugees or asylum seekers? How do you see those distinctions? And um, Pierre-Marie, we'll start with you. Uh, I think the anywhere, the anywhere is the people that that, that believe in that are living in a bubble. They thought that the Western uh, uh, civilization would grow and grow until, until I don't know, paradise happens or uh, they become God. I don't know, seriously, they, they want to become God. Um, so they live in a bubble. Unfortunately, the world is not <laughs> a paradise and you have some people that will steal from you, that will rape you, that will kill you if you don't defend yourself. Uh, and if it's not you, it's your brother, your daughter, or whatever. So uh, we have to be, we have to stop being children, and Europeans have to start being adults and saying, if you don't defend your family, if you don't defend your friends and your society, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to, it's going to die first uh, by itself, but it's going to die because other people will kill it. Um, so. Um, I don't know. I know it's not very a very positive uh, way of thinking, but but it's it really. I'm a young father, for example, and I, I realize that over time, one of the main benefits of growing and getting old is uh, t is uh, be, uh, taking responsibility for what you do. And for for some people, I am responsible for my wife and my 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 little son. Uh, so I'm responsible for them, and I have to. Sometimes I may not find uh, everything I do uh, perfectly beautiful, and uh, I don't know. Um, if, uh, I, I could work in, in, in an NGO. Well, I do work in an NGO. But I could work in an NGO abroad and help. I don't know people. I don't know. I could do that, but uh, I'm not sure I could support my family. And so these things, um, on an individual level, you, you feel them, and I think collectively we have to, to feel them as well. Uh, we have to be adults and understand that uh, we have to stand for ourselves. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one thing that puzzles me with uh, Anywheres is that they, uh, they are completely ignoring culture and religion. I mean, they, they cannot understand the force that is behind, for instance, uh, political Islam. They just ignore it. And as they ignored um, 
the different uh, potential between, let's say, Germany after the Second War, World War, Estonia after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, to establish democracy compared with Afghanistan or Iraq. They just ignored it because they couldn't see the difference between a clan society and a proper nation state. I mean, so, so and they, they, to a large extent, they still fail to see these things, which is why whole areas in our big cities are allowed to become Islamicized, for instance. Uh, they just ignore it. Um, and they ignore it until uh, the uh, voters uh, vote them out of office. They won't become more sage. They won't, won't, uh, they won't realize that they were wrong. They just need to be uh, thrown out of office. Uh, so, so that we need to do, us who, who defend uh, the interests of, 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 of somewheres. I mean, in my heart, I'm a somewhere, but sitting here in Brussels, speaking English, uh, you know, it, maybe I'm not a hundred percent somewhere, but this is where I came from. This is what I defend. Um, and um, as regards um, the other point, uh, economic migration, I mean, economic uh, migration will always happen to a certain extent. I mean, in, in the case of Sweden, my party is in favor of high skilled labor migration. Yes. Uh, but uh, we are looking into the cultural effects, of course. Uh, we won't accept any migration that would um, be a cultural burden on Sweden. Uh, but I mean, if 5,000 American engineers would want to come to Sweden, we would be very much for it. Uh, but economic migration is a very wide term. I mean, it's the main driving force uh, behind the mass migration to Europe, to the United Kingdom, and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, I would advise uh, uh, conservative-minded people in the UK not to name those people cr crossing the channels uh, refugees. They're migrants, they're economic migrants. I mean, I don't blame them for looking for a be better future, but they are coming from Albania, for instance, they are not refugees. Well, they're, coming, are, they're coming from France. All yeah, of yeah, them indeed. are coming from France. Yeah, which is know. not <laughs> always a safe country, but I mean, officially it is. <laughs> well, I, I just like to build on that. I mean, I think, um, I think largely these uh, multicultural silos, if you like, that we create in our inner cities and urban areas which are overlooked are ignored. But I think it's worse than that. I think it's more than our political leaders ignore them. We are told that we should not in any way challenge them, that we must embrace their culture, that it is our culture that it is, that's wrong if we don't embrace their culture. We are making ourselves subsidiary to these foreign cultures that are coming into the, certainly into the United Kingdom. And, um, Multiculturalism is not working in the UK. It is divisive. It is not creating a homogeneous society where the best of all values are coming forward in some kind of melded, uh, coherent new culture. What you're getting is division. So we had in Leicester a few months ago, it kicking off between Indians and Pakistanis because India beat Pakistan in a cricket match. And we had serious violence on the streets because of that. You wouldn't expect that in the United Kingdom. You had the, you have in, who's heard of Hamza Youssef? He's our new first minister in Scotland. He did a one minute tirade. You'd, I recommend you look it up on YouTube. He did a one minute tirade against white people saying that there were too many white people in office. This is the first minister of a devolved authority in the United Kingdom. And so, we welcome these people in, they operate in their silos, but the anywheres then get outnumbered and the anywheres are no longer in office. And what you have is Hamza Youssef as the first minister of Scotland talking against the vast majority of the Scottish population. You have Sadi Khan in London who talks against, again, he, he, he claimed the other day that London was built by immigrants. Actually, London was not built by immigrants. I can assure you, London was built by British citizens. And, um, and in Northern Ireland, this isn't quite the same thing, but in Northern Ireland, we have a first minister that will not denounce terrorism against the United Kingdom. That is how political, you know, uh, 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 what's her name, Michelle O'Neill, who represents Sinn Féin. 
This is the political arm of the IRA. She will not denounce terrorism against the United Kingdom. Her lot blew up the king's uncle, yet she was invited to the coronation. That is how hollowed out we have become as a nation in the beliefs and values that we used to hold. Um, and it's happened in the last 30 or 40 years. It's a great shame. I think the trajectory is awful unless we get a rapid grip. And as you said, you have to protect your loved ones, your family, your community, your nation state. You can be European, but for God's sake, be Swedish. And you know, protect yourselves. Unless we get a grip of that, we've got real issues. I, I see um, so many attentive faces, and I'm sure there are questions from the audience. Uh, we're a little limited on time, so I would ask uh, any, anyone who wants to ask a question to make it succinct, uh, not a comment, and direct it to a particular speaker. Thank you very much. Um, Tom Klaus Pritchard from the Pinsker Centre in London. Um, my question is for, for Ben Habib. Uh, I live in, in Kent, um, so I can see Calais from my house, to, to coin a Sarah Palin phrase. Um, what, what would be your solution to the uh, migrant crisis in the English Channel, sir? Well, I, I would invoke Article 33 of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, and I would I would either make border force do their job or sack all of them and replace them with someone that, you know, with people who will do their job. And I would have a specialized boat service that could tackle dinghies, hold them in check and require them to go back. And if, you know, forgive me, if the French Navy try to intercede to make sure that these boats were coming into British waters, we'd have to We'd have to, I'm afraid, challenge the French Navy. I hope you do it, because if you do it, we're going to do it with Italy and, and with Spain and, you, and so on. Absolutely, you have yeah. a chain reaction. It's the only way to do it. Um, in February, a book was published by a non-suspect, non-conservative uh, academic, Ruth Koopmans, a Dutch sociologist based in Germany, called the, the Asyl Lodge. And it basically says, in summary, that Seven years, seven recent years of asylum policy, immigration policy, uh, EU's policy has caused more deaths than had those people just <laughs> remained where they were. Now, I would have expected that book to, you know, make a massive impact on EU policies, but it's been very quiet. Um, Charlie, could you comment on that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I know uh, Rud Kopmans a little bit. He's, he's a uh, great... Um, great professor and uh, he's wor very worth listening to. Uh, I think his book has not been published in English yet, which is one of the reasons why it has been quiet. But he's, he's totally right. I mean, I visited IDP camps in, in uh, Iraq, for example, and the UN, UNHCR at the height of the ISIS offensive was desperate to get governments to fund uh, education material so not to get you know lost generations of children in those camps medicines um, medical personnel so on and so forth but the Europeans were more interested in receiving huge numbers of migrants into their territory spending I think the Danish government has calculated it costs 700,000 euros per migrant this is this is the um, um, this is the price we pay for to to uh, uh, signal solidarity, if you will, uh, or to signal virtues. Uh, there's always a trade-off, and the result is right there in front of our eyes if we just dare to look at it. So, um, Mr. Kopmans, Professor Kopmans, is, is totally right in in pointing that out, and also in pointing out that, you know, when we are pursuing these policies in Europe, it's an invitation uh, ticket to uh, Africans, uh, Asians, to go on these very perilous journeys across the Mediterranean. I think the center left should be ashamed for letting this continue to happen when they know that there is an effective means to stop it, the Australians, they had debts at sea outside their uh, coast. It decreased to zero when they implemented their model. We can do it as well. I'm afraid we're going to have to end the questions here. Uh, I thank everyone in the audience uh, for being here, and in particular thanks to the panel. 
I think we all benefited quite a lot from um, the expertise, and I hope this conversation continues, particularly as it relates to the idea of, let's say, subsidiarity. Let's start with protecting our families, our communities, uh, and encourage our local, um, regional, and of course, national uh, lawmakers to pay attention to what the people are saying. So thank you very much.